This week's episode is kindly sponsored by the Moonbase Alpha Technical Operations Manual, available on the Jerry Anderson Store. This is an exciting one. Stick around at the end for more information. After taking heavy losses in their centuries-long war with the Flood, the Forerunners commissioned an array of titanic superweapons called Halos to be used to deny host lifeforms to their parasitic enemy. This first array consisted of 12 30,000 km diameter rings. Although they proved to be structurally unstable and impractically large, as moving them had a deleterious effect on superluminous travel and communications due to huge amounts of particle reconciliation debt. All but one one of these original devices were eventually lost or destroyed. A second halo array of six 10,000 km diameter rings followed, constructed in secret outside of the galaxy at Installation 00. These more powerful, more efficient rings were joined by the sole survivor of the original array after it had been refit and reduced in size after taking extensive damage. At the cusp of their defeat by the Flood, the Forerunners activated the array, completely sterilizing the entire galaxy of complex, intelligent beings. The Flood were defeated, and life receded by the remaining Forerunners, protected from the Array's effects by their shield worlds and at the distant Ark. Almost 100,000 years later, humanity discovered one of these megastructures after following coordinates found within a Forerunner ship buried on the planet Reach. These vast creations were constructed within the Great Forge at the heart of Installation 00, also known as the Ark. They were given a numbered designation based on their order of construction, and assigned an AI monitor to oversee their secondary functions. The structural backbone of the rings was built from super-dense foundational material, with a lattice of scaffolding laid on its inner surface. Hard light reinforcements supported the structure, helping it to withstand tidal forces from other large bodies in space. Vast tunnel networks, machinery and other structures were then threaded through the scaffolding, and a layer of panels was placed atop it. These panels formed an armature for the nearly 10 million square kilometres of terrain that followed, painted on by enormous terraforming factories. Access to the various facilities on the ring protruded through this thin veneer of landscape, rather than the buildings being built onto the land. The rings were capable of forcefully ejecting the terrain from their surfaces, or even entire segments as precautionary measures against the flood. Over time, missing or damaged segments could then be repaired and rebuilt by the many millions of sentinels kept on board. These autonomous robots came in many varieties, but were mainly intended for maintenance, repair and construction of the various biomes, facilities and systems of the Halo. They were also used for defence in the event of a flood outbreak, or surface landing by an external force. To prevent damage, the Halo could lock individual segments or even the entire ring into reflective slip space stasis, suspending them in time. This made the affected segments completely invulnerable, though maintaining stasis required a prodigious amount of energy. Gravity on the inner surface was provided by generators rather than due to the ring's rotation, which allowed each biome or refugia to have its own surface gravity and atmospheric conditions. The entire habitable inner surface of the rings was added after their original intent was partially co-opted by the Librarian as part of the conservation measure. This involved the indexing and collection of a number of intelligent galactic species before either the Flood or Halo Array destroyed them. After the array was fired, cloning facilities on the rings using this data were part of the reseeding effort that took place to restore complex life to the galaxy. While the array was intended to be fired from the Ark, it was possible to trigger the rings directly. This was done using the Halo's index, stored in the rings library. Each index was tied to its specific installation, but it was possible to use the index from a destroyed Halo on its replacement. The firing sequence was activated when the index was inserted into the core inside the control room, triggering phase pulse generators to begin channeling energy into the open space at the ring's centre, siphoning vacuum energy from local space-time. It was possible to interrupt the firing sequence at this point, with the control room firing a burst into the collected energy which caused it to implode and dissipate harmlessly. If uninterrupted, the energy collection continued until it blasted outward at superluminal speeds. 
eventually reaching near-infinite velocity. This led to causal paradoxes, with two halos reporting pre-echoes of the array being fired before it was triggered. This superluminous pulse was made up of cross-phased supermassive neutrinos, tuned to emit a harmonic frequency that destroyed the nervous system of any life form within the ring's 25,000 light-year range. This left simpler organisms and inanimate objects unaffected, although precursor technology with its reliance on quasi-living neural physics was also destroyed. While the halos were intended to fire in concert with one another, it was possible to fire them individually, as well as being able to scale down the area of effect to target specific systems or even single planets. During early testing of this weapon, it was found that its effect on a planet led to severe ecological damage from rotting biomatter before it could be reseeded. To combat this, a substance called a solute was applied to many planets before the array's firing by the Forerunner lifeworkers. This caused any life form affected by the array's weapon to instantly decay into their component molecules. The facilities for the Halo's main weapon took up much of its structure, but there were many other secondary and tertiary facilities. The three most important locations were the Cartographer, which contained a complete schematic and real-time record of its host installation, the Control Room, which provided an interface for the Ring's core, its central controlling computer, and the extensively protected library, the safe location for the Ring's index, as well as being its lifeform archive. There were also flood, containment, and research facilities present intended to be used to find another way to combat the virulent organisms. Their containment measures proved ineffective, however, and the Flood eventually made a resurgence. As they were a key part of these containment measures, Sentinel manufacturing facilities floated far above the installation's surface, out of reach of any potential outbreaks. To move between these disparate facilities, Sentinels used a vast network of hidden tunnels and caves beneath the ring's surface, while the Monitor could tap into a teleportation grid for instantaneous transport. The Halo itself was also capable of moving, while they were sent to their final firing position via slipspace portal generated by the Ark, they could also enter slipspace by themselves. For smaller manoeuvres such as avoiding collisions or weapons fire, there were drive engines spaced along the outer rim. This was also where the Confidence Class Weapons Array was located, to be used by the installation's monitor to enforce an exclusion zone if they so desired, such as when the UNSC Pillar of Autumn first found Installation 04 in 2552. This ring was the first in the array to be fired, giving it the designation of Alpha Halo, with the others following suit. It was located within the Orion Arm of the galaxy, making it the closest one of the seven to human territory. The arrival of the Pillar of Autumn and the Covenant fleet began a chain of events that led to the near activation of the array, only halted by the detonation of the Pillar of Autumn's fusion reactors by the Spartan John 117, causing the ring to shatter. After this, the Ark automatically began construction of Alpha Halo's replacement, Installation 08. Only a few short months later, the forces of the Covenant, UNSC, Sangeli, and Flood all arrived at the Ark and discovered this new ring. Using the index from Installation 04, John 117 activated the incomplete Halo, once more wiping out the Flood, destroying the ring, and significantly damaging the Ark. Several years later, in 2559, the UNSC Spirit of Fire was drawn to the Ark, where Professor Ellen Anders discovered a second, fully complete replacement. As they were stranded at the Ark, the crew of the Spirit of Fire intended to use Installation 09 as a distress beacon, sending it through slipspace to its firing position in the Sol system. However, before it could reach its destination, it was intercepted by a Guardian, leaving its ultimate fate unknown. These vast megastructures changed the face of the galaxy forever, and more than once saved it from the endless tide of the Flood. However, they remained spread across the galaxy, concealing a treasure trove of ancient Forerunner secrets, with their destructive power waiting to be unleashed once more. Thanks for watching everyone, this week's episode was kindly sponsored by the Moonbase Alpha Technical Operations Manual. Now if there's two things that I love, it's Jerry Anderson 
and technical manuals. So I'm pretty stoked to be advertising this one. This is a 272 page hardback manual based around Moonbase Alpha from Space 1999 and all of its various auxiliary craft and equipment. It's laid out in these gorgeous spreads with wonderful graphics and fantastic 3D renders, hundreds of brand new illustrations, and it's all vetted through science advisors who are qualified scientists and there's lots of fascinating technical and scientific details covering all of these heritage sci-fi designs in that classic quintessential visual aesthetic that Space 1999 had. I loved Jerry Anderson as a kid. I grew up on Thunderbirds and Captain Scarlet and Space 1999. And I think it's incredibly cool that the work of Jerry Anderson is still relevant enough that stuff like this is getting made. And I get to geek out on it in the same way that I did as a much smaller space docker, a wharf, a jetty, if you will. It's currently available from the Jerry Anderson store. That's shop.jerryanderson.com. If you pre-order before the 19th of September, you get an awesome poster and a patch. I love a patch. Patches are great. And not only is there the standard edition, but there's also the incredibly cool special edition, which comes in a futuristic looking flight case, like a hard case. And along with the book in that, you'll also get an identity card, a travel tube network map, a radiation detector, anti-rad pills, which are mints, and an individually numbered letter from Commissioner Simmons. And if you don't think this is unbelievably cool, I dare say you're on the wrong channel, because this is just fantastically awesome as far as I'm concerned. So if, like me, you have a growing mountain of sci-fi source books, that you want to top off with a particularly new and swanky one, I would suggest you head over to shop.jerryanderson.com, follow the link in the description, and pre-order your copy of the Moonbase Alpha Technical Operations Manual. And thank you so much to the Jerry Anderson store for this sponsorship that I was very excited to agree to. It's not often that I get to plug something I am so entirely enthusiastic about, so please do check it out. Thank you all for watching. This is Daniel from Space Doc, signing off. Yeah.